Hey everybody, this is Derek Goodwin with P9 Cam, and joining me today is Tim Paul from Autodesk. How are you doing, Tim? Good, how are you? Thanks good, for inviting me. Good. Oh, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. So we've got quite a few people uh, online today. Um, some of you will have done this with us before. For some of you, it will be brand new. So go ahead and uh, type your questions into the questions pane um, as you have them. And if it's something where we need to stop and answer it immediately, we will. Or we'll kind of wait for and, and take a break every few minutes. So just as a sound check, um, can you guys, somebody out there, just tell me if you can hear my audio. And if audio is good, just, just type it into the chat of the questions. There we go. Everybody says audio looks good. Okay, so we're ready to go. Now, what we're looking at here is a, or let me start off actually. So this is the, this is our very first 3D course for uh, P9 Cam, and what we're doing here is inviting our customers to come in. We're going to run four of them this month in April. Uh, beyond April, we're probably going to slow down to about one every two weeks. Um, we'll try to run them on Friday at noon, so Friday seems to be a little slower day and people can just grab a sandwich and, uh, and watch the webinar. Uh, this one's going to be 3D toolpaths, and I just kind of picked a part here. This is a part that I made quite a few years ago, so I think it's okay to show it. It's been revised a lot since then, and this was a speaker housing. And if I remember rightly, we made it from a glass-filled nylon, so it's kind of a plastic part. And I'm really just you know, sh trying to show here also a little bit of technique for 3D cutting. So a lot of times if you're going to make a part from plastic, you need to be careful if you haven't done this before. Um, so give me a call if you want some advice on this. But a lot of times we can just hold this down with double back tape. So that's how I'm kind of simulating this job today. So what we did is we've made a piece of raw material that's um, a little bit bigger than the part, and I went ahead and faced it down to thickness, and then this, I'm simulating here just holding it down onto a subplate with double back tape, and put in a couple of uh, locating features out here, these two locating holes. So basically, we would machine up one from the top side as you see it here. Um, typically, anytime you've got a flat surface, you'll try and use that for as op one and we will machine internally in, in this cavity using 3D toolpaths and then we'll flip the part over. We'll machine these remaining surfaces here with 3D toolpaths and then the last thing we'll do is run a 2D contour toolpath around the part to break it out from the plastic. And as long as you do that carefully and you take those last few depth cuts as really light cuts, you can actually just pull this part up off the table and be a nice finished part in two ops. So typical model making job, plastic part, we can make quick work of it. Now after we do this, I'm going to switch over to uh, Tim's screen and Tim's going to show us a few tricks for using 3D toolpaths on a regular standard rectangular part. So don't think of 3D toolpaths as only being useful when you have this kind of curved geometry. 3D toolpaths can be used pretty much on any part you make. So let's go ahead. What I'm going to do here really is just show you how I started making the part. So if I expand, let's see. So over here in my solid bodies, basically I've created a piece of stock to simulate the raw material. Uh, a lot of times I will do that, not always, but uh, very often. And the, the other thing I've done here, let's see if I go ahead and make this visible for a minute and I'll just keep it transparent. Uh, the other thing I've done in SolidWorks, and this is kind of standard for me, and chime in Tim anytime if you do things differently, because remember everybody, if you talk to 10 machinists, they're going to tell you 10 different ways of doing things. Uh, but the way I do it is um, if I'm going to only apply toolpaths, if I have no CAD work to do, the one thing I will do in SolidWorks is create a work coordinate system to represent my origin on the machine. And in this case, um, I'm putting my origin in basically in the middle of the part, at the bottom of the part where the, the table is. Again, plastic model maker trick, uh, a lot of times that's where they'll keep their zero. That way when you flip the part over, the uh, other zero will basically be in the same place. 
So as far as prep, add, yep, Tim. I was going to say if I could add a nice little tip that I that I've kind of discovered is I name those you know G54 slash zero G55 slash two. Uh, that way, when you're picking them in a in a job, uh, it's really kind of easy to um, kind of keep track of them. Sometimes you get a lot of operations and they can start getting kind of ugly. So it's kind of a nice little tip if you want to. Absolutely. So I you do actually do that myself. So very good. Thank you. So that's basically all the prep work we needed to do. Now I haven't gotten into how did I create this solid body because I want to focus today on 3D tool paths. For those of you who are brand new to SolidWorks and need some SolidWorks or inventor training, uh, we do have a SolidWorks scheduled uh, in this month in a couple of weeks and we'll do some inventor starting next month. So that'll be kind of a different class and in those classes I think what we'll do is we'll just focus on the CAD and um, get some good learning in there. So now we're ready to go and actually I was toggling back and forth here but typically I would toggle to my cam tab and turn on the cam manager and really I'm just going to walk down here and show you how I made the part and then if, if you have questions we can go in and basically recreate or do what we need to do to, to help you guys figure things out. Um, as I started working on this part today, uh, it's a little bit tricky, um, so it's a little bit kind of a, of a stretch to try and get this thing programmed here in an hour or two, um, but I've gotten some of it done and I think you guys, I think there's enough that you'll get the basic idea uh, for, for at least how to get started with 3D Toolpaths. So we have our work coordinate system set up here. We'll go ahead and populate our model here. So in our job setup, we always have to define three things at a minimum. We have to define our model. We have to define our stock, which I've picked this material body. And we have to define our work coordinate system. So those are the three things I've done. I've also went ahead and picked a machine already. Um, so because I've already got machines in here you're seeing populated here uh, looks like we got a VF2 Haas VF2 and because I did that I'm gonna need to click and just generate the tool pass real quick so that's gonna take a second now it does take time to generate 3d tool paths because the system is looking at the model it's looking at the stock so it's got a lot to figure out. It's got to figure out where it's going to take away material and where it's going to leave material. So it definitely takes time. And you can see that um, most of these have already generated. This adaptive is still taking a, a minute or two to generate here, making my computer work hard. So I'm on a Dell laptop, M4800. It's a pretty decent laptop. And the step over on this cut is, is about 0.1, but this part is about 10 inches long, right? I think the part's about 9 inches long, so there are a lot of tool paths to generate in there. Yeah, good. This is Tim. This might be a good time to, to bring up the distributed cam topic. Um, mm -hmm. When I was working at L3, we did a lot of uh, big, big tool paths. And having distributed cam on a few other computers, it really sped up our, our calculations by using you know, other computers on the network. So right. something to think about if anybody's having a time time issue. Yeah, I know a couple of the guys out there from one of the customers. I was talking to to one of them today, and, and they do have that issue. Um, so that's something to look into. So the way we do that is um, contact us if you're interested in distributed uh, cam. And I haven't set it up myself, Tim, but you probably know better than me. But uh, I think what we do is we, we send you a link to a file that would be downloaded and installed on your server. Is that, is that how it works? Uh, the, way it, the way it works is uh, you would install it on just a handful of, uh, or I think up to eight computers on your network. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a 100 meg file. I think you can even download it uh, for free on our, on our website. But um, so what, it, what you do is you put it on other, other computers, and as those aren't being utilized, uh, it, it uses their processor speed to, to help calculate some things. It's very, very easy. To, it takes probably 30 seconds to install it on, on the other computers. Right. And I, I was seeing uh, 
time calculations going from you know 45 seconds to 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. But the faster things get, the less patience I seem to have. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, if you were doing these tool paths 10 or 15 years ago, you had to rent yeah. a workstation and go away for an hour or two. So what we'll try and do, I'll try and minimize how many times I have to actually regenerate these tool paths. So if I click on the adaptive clearing tool path, so the very first thing I did was to rough out this part, and I just wanted to rough the, the internal cavity. I don't really want to machine around the outside of the part in this operation because that's just going to release it from the plastic. So I'm just going to control it onto the inside. And the way I would do that, uh, I would pick an adaptive clearing from the 3D milling toolpath. Adaptive clearing is the first toolpath. Uh, typically, I face off a part. I don't have a facing toolpath here because I've just kind of been assuming that we're at the finished thickness. But typically, my second toolpath, no matter what part I'm running, is an adaptive clearing. Unless it's little tight areas like slots, but anytime I've got a machine away, a lot of material, I'm going to use an adaptive clearing toolpath. It's a high-speed toolpath, so the software is going to maintain a constant load on your end mill. It'll never, it'll never take more material than you've specified with that load. So if it comes, to, you know, if it finds itself in a tight spot where it's got to clear out a slot, it's going to make tricoidal moves uh, based on the load that you've defined and machine that material very efficiently. It's going to maintain a climb cut. So what I'm going to do to try and get away from regenerating is I'm just going to edit this toolpath and walk you through what we've got. So the first thing I did was to pick a tool from our library. So click on the library and selecting a quarter inch diameter ball end mill. Select that. Now remember these five tabs are always constant across all of our tool paths except for the drilling tool paths that only have four tabs. So your tool is your first tab, your geometry selection is your second tab, Defining your heights, your depth of cut, your clearance heights, all that goes on the third tab. The fourth tab is where you define your passes. So these are your step overs, your step downs, stock to leave, this kind of thing. And then this last tab is for lead ins and lead outs. And generally I leave this tab alone unless I, unless I need to do something on this tab. Um, sometimes when we do have problems generating a tool path, especially if it's in a tight area where the end mill is close to the size of the geometry, um, if you are having problems, a lot of times you do want to take a look on this last tab because that might be where you're having your problem. For example, there's a minimum ramp diameter here that's specified that sometimes if you don't have enough room for it to actually make that move, your tool path just doesn't work. So this is a good place to, to look if you do have problems. In this case, I've created a containment boundary or defined a containment boundary. So basically, I'm saying with the tool inside boundary, I'm just saying rough out this entire part, but keep the tool inside that, that geometry boundary. Okay, on the Heights tab, and for me coming over from legacy CAM software, this Heights tab was the the hardest one for me to figure out. I just had to get my head around it. But basically your clearance height is defined in this case as being 0.4 above the part. Our retract height, so every time the end mill comes out of the cut, it's going to retract to this height. This height is the top. This is where the cut begins. This is where the end mill will start to encounter material in the Z direction. And then the bottom could be defined as just depth of cut. And in this case, we're inside a cavity, so the depth will be taken care of. It's you know take care of itself based on the model geometry. Uh, so I can just leave this set to model bottom. On my passes tab, this is the optimal load that I have defined. So 0.1 quarter inch diameter end mill cutting about 0.427 in plastic, so this is pretty conservative. Um, I might take that down to 50 thousandths or so if I was concerned that that was you know, too much of a load. So these are high-speed tool paths. So basically, we want to cut as deep as we can with the very first pass, 
and then so basically it will go into the center of the pocket helical down all the way to the bottom of the pocket and then start spiraling out using high-speed machining to to rough out all of the material on the inside now this that we've got some curve to the bottom of this so it will not be able to stay at 0.427 down in the cut. It's going to need to step up as it expands out, and that step up value is going to be here, or find step down. We call it step down. I think it's actually a step up. But either way, basically, that's how it's going to get rid of that staircase effect, or at least within the value that you've got defined here. So it's going to go down to 0.427 deep, start roughing out, and then start stepping up as it needs to. So I'm just going to click OK there and do a stock simulation just to give you an idea of what this toolpath looks like. So here's a typical high-speed machining toolpath, helical entry into the part. It's maintaining a climb cut, and it's maintaining a load on the tool of 0.1. And you see in these tight areas in the slots, it's just making trochoidal moves. It's, it's not just pushing the end mill through that slot. Our second tool path is a contour. Now, here's where we get into kind of the dark arts of 3D machining. There really is no standard way to do 3D machining. It's something that you learn with experience, and it's something that changes with every single part you make. So you need to kind of become aware of what 3D machining tool paths are available to you. And Roughing can be pretty much handled by adaptive clearing. That's really all you need to do to rough. It does a great job. But there are a lot of finishing strategies. These are all 3D tool paths that use different strategies. So kind of the typical one is that 3D contour is it goes around the part, and then it takes a step down, and then goes around, takes a step down, goes around, takes a step down. So a 3D contour is a good toolpath to use when you have curvature and you have walls that are vertical or near vertical. Now parallel works basically is basically the opposite. It doesn't take a step down, it takes a step over. So it takes a step over, moves over, comes back, moves over, comes back. So a parallel, and I'll show you both of these cuts here in, in, on this part, a parallel is, is better off for uh, surfaces that are nearer to horizontal. You'll get a better surface finish using parallel. If your surface is horizontal or close to horizontal, you'll get a better uh, for surface finish using contour when your walls are vertical or close to vertical. Scallop is kind of a hybrid between the two, so a lot of people use scallop. It's a good tool path. Uh, it does kind of a collapsing, so what it does is it maintains a constant scallop whether or not it's on a vertical, near vertical, or near horizontal wall. But it can be a time-consuming tool path, so you're just going to have to start practicing with these and working with them, and you'll start to gain experience and understand what toolpath does what. Uh, pencil toolpath is a good one for just tracing inner walls. When you have uh, you have fillets down at the bottom of a pocket, you can use a pencil toolpath and it'll just drive itself along that fillet. Radial, spiral, um, you use those you know sometimes when the case is right. So if you have something like a dish, imagine a round dish or a round bowl that would be a, a good case where a spiral or a radial would give you the desired surface finish. Uh, more spiral, we've got some examples. I think maybe in the next 3D class, uh, Tim and I were looking at a couple of good examples a little bit earlier uh, that where we basically go through and show you all of the different tool paths. So I think we'll save that for the next class. Um, Ramp just basically does a contour around and around and around. You can use that for a lot of good things. Uh, project is where you take a flat geometry section and project it onto a curved face. Morph um, helps morph between two 
contours. So again, the uh, the next class is where we'll cover the morph morph tool path. And then flow is one of my favorites. I'm not actually using it on this part, but a flow line toolpath, if you just have a single fillet along a part or a single angled wall, flow is a great way to just throw a quick 3D toolpath on it. So what I'm using today is basically the adaptive as a rougher, contour, we will use scallop. We'll use some contour again, and we'll use some parallel. So that's what we'll focus on on this 3D part. And then Tim's going to show you some tricks shortly on a regular rectangular part. So let's take a look at this 3D contour. What I'm doing here is I'm machining the walls that are vertical or close to vertical. So if you see the blue lines, those are the cut lines, and the yellow lines are the retract lines or the rapid move. So it needs to go around and then wrap it somewhere else. Now there are some strategies for minimizing the rapids, and I was working on that this morning, but the, um, the generation time is a lot more, so I'm leaving those kind of loose for the purpose of this demonstration just so we don't spend a lot of time regenerating toolpaths. But what I've done here is thrown on a 3D contour toolpath. And then I'll just edit the toolpath to show you what we've got going on. Now, if you remember, I've picked a 1 8 diameter ball for this. And a minute ago, I was talking about what's the difference between a 3D contour and a 3D parallel. A 3D contour is pretty good for vertical walls. So again, I've picked a boundary, which is this inside edge going all the way around the part. And that's my boundary. I want the tool to stay on the inside of that. I don't want to machine the outside of the part yet. And I also did not want this contour toolpath to machine this bottom surface because a 3D contour does a step down instead of a step over. So it gives us a terrible surface finish on the bottom surface. So what I did is I selected those bottom faces as check surfaces. And what a check surface is, is a surface that we don't want to cut. So by selecting all these faces down here at the bottom, I, I, did, I define those as areas not to cut. Again, on my Heights tab, just we're entering the cut at the top of the model. Go as deep as you need to down to the bottom of the model, but no deeper. We have a step down in this case because it's a 3D contour. So I have 0.01 as my step down with a quarter inch ball end mill. That'll give me a pretty good surface finish. And that's about it. That's all I had to really do on that 3D contour. So if we do a quick stock simulation, I'll kind of speed it up just so maybe that's a little too fast to actually see. Okay, that, that went really fast. But if you look at the blue area, the end mill has gone around and around and around and finished those walls that are vertical or near to ver vertical. It has not yet done anything on the bottom floor. So the bottom floor I'm going to handle with a different toolpath. And let me just back up for a minute because I see we have a question. Can you show the selection of the walls you want to cut? So let's try that and see if we can get it to... So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a trick here to see if we can get this to just work exactly the way I did it. So I'm going to right mouse click on this toolpath and I'm going to say make default. And hopefully that will just save all the same settings for me and let's try that. So basically what Brian's asking here is just, hey, show me how you selected those walls. So what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to try and remember how I selected them. We'll go into a 3D contour. Now, we're cutting these with the 1 8 ball on the geometry tab. We don't need to select any geometry, Brian, because the model is already has already been defined as our model. 
So there's no geometry to select. And if I just clicked OK, it would just cut a 3D contour. It would cut everything it sees on that part. So what I'm doing here, rather than selecting geometry, I'm telling it geometry that I don't want it to cut. So in this case, I'm going to uncheck Propagate Along Z, and this is SolidWorks functionality here. So whenever this blue is, whenever the box is blue, it's waiting for you to make a selection. And I'm going to click this inside edge. Now, this was something, oh, what I did is I actually clicked on the face, which, you know, you can do sometimes, but we want an edge in this case. Ah. So what I need to do is go back into SolidWorks and just make my material invisible. And then that will allow me to select things a lot easier. So let's try that again. You'll notice it looks like the material is visible here. That's because it's defined as the stock, but it's not actually it's not actually the model being visible. It's just showing what our stock has been defined as. So let's get back into their 3D milling contour. Select my 1 8 ball. Go into my geometry tab. So again, I'm not going to select geometry to cut in this case. I'm going to select what I don't want it to cut. So for a machining boundary, I'm going to pick that edge and it's going to automatically populate the entire edge. That's good. And then what I did not want it to cut was were these bottom surfaces. So I checked the box that says we're going to have checked surfaces. Now that this box is blue, it means it's ready to take selections. And I just picked these guys in here and just for the purpose of this, I didn't bother going in and clicking every little face inside here because actually if the end mill goes in there a little bit, it's not going to hurt me for this sample part. We're going to go in there later and, and machine those pockets properly anyway. So let's check our heights tab. Starting from the model top down to the model bottom, that all looks good. Uh, we've got a 10 thousandths step down. And everything there looks okay, so I'll click OK and we'll see how that pans out. So that's basically it. So 3D contour cut, and we defined a containment boundary, told it to stay inside the containment boundary, and we selected some check surfaces on the bottom and told it to stay inside those check surfaces. Okay, now the next cut we did was a scallop cut. So remember, we've already done the walls that are vertical or near to vertical. We've finished those with the contour cut. Now we need to cut the bottom here. And I, again, this, I may do this with a parallel. It would probably work okay, but I know it would need to jump over these guys. So I just thought, why don't I just try a scallop cut with, with for this? And it actually worked pretty good. So if you look at the toolpath down there, we've got complete coverage inside with this scallop cut. So I'll edit that toolpath. Again, scallop was on the 3D drop-down menu. I'm choosing the 1 8 diameter ball end mill. And then in this case, um, what I did with the machining boundary is I just selected this inside wall and I won't select it now because I remember because there's a lot of other intersecting geometry, it wasn't able to just pick the whole thing. I had to kind of chase this chain around here, click, click, click around until I got exactly what I wanted. Uh, but that worked pretty good. Go to the Heights tab. Again, we want to cut from the model top to the model bottom. We have our scallop step over. And click OK, it shouldn't need to regenerate, and it doesn't. So basically, we have now roughed and finished the whole part except for the details. And of course, devil's always in the details. But you can see you can make pretty quick work of most of your part. So we got this thing roughed out pretty good. We still got some work to do in here. And I've got my quality turned all the way down here, so I'll 
turn that up next time I run that. Right, let's see if I can make that look a little bit better. I think you want, yeah, one above that. There you go. No, no. No. You're just talking about re re resetting the simulation, right? Yeah. And I should be able to just fast forward. So for the most part, we've got that finished out. Some of these radii might actually be a little tighter, and I would have to, in the real world, go in with a 1 16th ball end mill. But for the purpose of the demonstration, we'll show you this. And still, this, this looks a little bit pixelated. But you can see that we've still got some work done to do in here. OK, so. What I did for these little guys, the, this is where it does start to get time consuming when you have the small details. So in this case, I got a scallop tool with a 1 8 end mill kind of running in there, but that 1 8 end mill is, is really too big to get us any fine detail in here. So what we're going to do here is put in a 3D contour cut, again, just from the 3D contour drop down menu, and then I'll edit the tool path to show you what we have. So for the tool, I've selected a 1 16th diameter ball end mill. Again, we don't need to pick geometry to cut. We just need to control where it cuts. So I've selected these four edges of these pockets as containment boundaries, just basically saying stay inside that boundary. Heights tab, nothing to change here. Uh, actually, it's defaulting to some weird values here, but I can quickly change that. It's going to stay inside the boundaries anyway, so it wasn't going to cut anything other than what's inside the boundary. Um, smaller end mill, so it requires a smaller maximum step down. So I've gone down to three thousandths for the step down. And I've changed something. That's the danger of doing live TV, folks. Uh, what have I done to make this thing not work? Ah, so yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I said this, the top is the model bottom, and that's not going to work. So from the model top to the model bottom is the zone we want to machine the part. And there we go. So this can happen. I'm sure you've all had this happen as you're working in HSM work. Sometimes you just don't get a tool path. Um, it can be a little bit frustrating because you don't know what's wrong. Um, but you, if you get in there, look that through all the tabs and work logically, uh, you will find it. Um, one thing I do recommend is when I'm troubleshooting a tool path, I'll tend to fix one thing at a time and then regenerate it, see what happens, because if you change 10 things and it works, you don't know which one actually solved the problem. So Derek, if you, um, mm -hmm. you right-click on that, that mm -hmm. tool operation mm -hmm. and then do show log, mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in that case, it probably would have said, uh, it would have told you what the problem was. Right, it probably, it would have said model top cannot be below model bottom or something like that. Exactly. Right, right. Sometimes that's a, a good quick way to, to find your problem. Yeah, so so log's a good quick way. And I'll tell you something else I've noticed. Um, I don't know if you've ever had this before where you run a toolpath and it works and then you run basically the same toolpath again and it doesn't. There's another kind of neat feature here. So if I control select two toolpaths and right mouse click and say compare and edit, yeah, it will actually compare the two cuts, yeah, and tells us if anything's different. So it comes down here and it says, okay, hang on, this first cut does not have check surfaces, but the second one you've selected does. So it's a good, and, and some of this is actually editable from right within here. It's like a spreadsheet. So if you looked at something, let's see, like let's say, for example, this contour had a step down of three thousands, and this one had a step down of one thousands. Um, sometimes, and actually, 
you can actually edit it right in here. So I want to be careful yeah, now. So expression. Yeah. Edit the expression, right. Yeah. So that's just a little handy okay. thing that I've found can help me troubleshoot toolpath sometimes. Yeah, Compare and Edit can be a great tool for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to change how your coolant works on a whole whole job or something like that, it's a really good way to do that. Okay. Uh, where's that? Down here? So if you just go to that little uh, window and do a search for coolant, see what happens. Um, to the right yeah, there. there. Just type C-O-O-L and then there you go. Right there. So Boom. Yeah, right. so that's where you can change it to air blast or coolant. So let's say you have one or two tools that normally run air blast. Uh, you can change them individually, or you can edit all on that third on that third column. So where it says edit all, if you go to the left, over left one more. Oh, there you so go. If you wanted to change everything you highlighted, mm -hmm. that's the place to do it right there. So I see. You can do that for. You can do that for RPM. You can do that for rapid heights. You can do that for you know anything you want to change all a whole bunch of operations at once. It's a really good place to do it. Right, that's a great feature. Yeah, yeah cool. So I'm learning more and more all the time. There's a lot of good stuff in this software. Yeah. Okay, so I got a little off track there, but. I was showing you the contour again. I attacked those near vertical walls with a 3D contour, but what about down at the bottom? Well, I did that with a 3D parallel because that will give me a constant step over instead of a step down. So again, 3D milling. I chose a parallel toolpath. I'll edit the toolpath and just show you what we've got going on. 1 16th diameter ball end mill. Again, I've selected those same four containment boundaries. Heights tab, stock top to model bottom will work just fine. And then you'll notice because this is a parallel cut, it doesn't have a step down, it has a step over setting. Three thousandths is a decent number for a 1 16th ball end mill. And we have our parallel cut. Okay, so that's the end of it there. This last contour was just the one I had uh, redone there showing uh, how to pick the selections. So at this point, it would be time to flip the part over. I like to flip from left to right. I'm still like old old style manual machinist. I always want to keep that same surface against the back jaw even when I don't have a back jaw. And then we'll just show you quickly what we were doing here on the back side. So now um, I did create a new job folder for the opposite side of the part. And the main thing I needed to pick there was the, the different work coordinate system. So I'll now right mouse click on this and I will say make default folder. And now we're working on this folder. And again, um, just getting ready to rough out the part. So the first thing I do is a 3D adaptive. And again, just kind of using the model maker tricks here, I didn't want to go around the outside of the part yet because once we're finished with this part, remember I said we're just holding it down with double back tape. So when we are finished, there's just going to be this very thin surface holding the part down to the tape. So I don't want to go down there and rough all the material away yet. This part right now is still connected to the material block around the outside of the part. Only the cavity has been machined on the other side. So I throw it on a 3D adaptive. Again, 3D milling, adaptive clearing. It's my go-to roughing strategy for any part I make. Right mouse click just to show you what's going on here. We've got a ball, quarter inch diameter ball end mill. Um, I've selected this outside edge of the part as my containment boundary. Just said keep the tool inside of that. Heights tab from the model top to the model bottom. Uh, I get sticking with my point one as my load. Uh, my depth of cut here, not quite as deep because there is not as much depth here to machine out and I want to get as close as I can to the net shape with my roughing ops. So I just went to a one thou uh, maximum step down, 
50,000 is fine step down and you can see how it's just basically roughed out the part. Uh, I'll just show a stock simulation just selecting this toolpath. Slow that down a little bit. And you see that's nicely roughed out. Then I went with a 3D parallel, and this was this is my finishing toolpath. And we can finish this whole surface nicely with the parallel toolpath. Again, you'll see it's just stepping over. Give us a really nice surface finish. And again, that was 3D parallel. I didn't choose contour because these are not vertical surfaces. These surfaces are closer to horizontal, so I chose parallel right mouse click on the toolpath. I've got a quarter inch diameter ball end mill. And I didn't even need to make a selection here. The software just figured it out. Stock top to model bottom. Step over of 10 thousandths, which will give us a pretty good surface finish. Clicked OK, and there we go. And then the last thing I did, and this is how we break out the part, is I just picked a 2D contour. Nothing fancy here. This is the, I think this might be the first 2D toolpath we've used on the whole part. 2D contour. And then I'll edit the toolpath to show what we picked. And I actually picked the part right here. And we've got a quarter inch diameter flat end mill. But if I go to my, um, let's try this again. It's always, something can always go wrong when I change things, but bear with me. So deselected, and I said, pick that entire edge right there. I didn't pick the bottom edge. I was, it was a little tricky because we've got this, like this little cutout here that was going to make me chase it around a little bit. So one of the things that I really like in the way the software works is that it's really intuitive about even though I'm picking an edge here that's not planar, it gets the idea and just with one click it drives that containment boundary or in this case the contour to cut um, into our selection box. So it's really good stuff there. Uh, nothing to change here. We're cutting from the model top to the model bottom. Passes, I just uh, allowed it to do one finish pass. So basically, I did check my multiple depths box. So we're going to go multiple depths. We're going 0.125 at a time. And, you know, we're holding this part, again, just a little thin wall with double back tape. So I can't go crazy in here when I go to cut it, or it's just going to break out once I get down to the bottom. So kind of going really conservative here. And then taking one roughing pass at each level and uh, one finish pass, and that's it. We've got a finished part. So if you guys have any questions, uh, now would be the time, and what we'll do here in a minute is we will switch over to Tim, and Tim will show, you, show us a couple more tricks on the prismatic part. So I'll do a stock simulation while we're getting ready here. Let's see if I can just get it to do the whole thing quickly. Quickly is relative when you're doing 3D toolpaths. Uh-oh. Got to be careful. I'm going to make my computer seize up here. So a lot of processing going on there, and we're running this GoToWebinar as well. So when I try to quickly spin that, I can have 
start to create problems. I'm, I'm low on resources here at the moment. So let that chug away for a minute. Uh, if you do have any questions, let me check one more time in here. So uh, so the selection, okay. Uh, got a comment from Richard, learned a lot in here. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. We do appreciate you being here. Okay, um, this is going to take a minute to simulate, so um, I can always come back to this screen later on. But uh, if you're ready, Tim, how about if we switch over yeah. and show us a few tricks on your side? Okay. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so I'm switching over to Tim. Take a moment, and you guys should see Tim's screen in just a few seconds. Okay, and there we go. I can see your okay. screen. Okay, so I I, um, I was I was showing our team an example of uh, how 3D adaptive clearing and some of the 3D toolpaths could could come in handy with without surfaced parts like this. You know, th these are easy to explain why you need that for something like this. But uh, a couple of our guys were trying to trying to see why you would want in a 3D toolpath for for a part. This was a really good example of something I've had to make before. There's a lot of Z levels. There's a lot going on in a part like that. So I, I quickly made this part to, to that's a pretty simple part, but when you when you break down actually having to get into it and cut it, you have you have a pocket that has a few different Z heights, a uh, couple couple different features. So really you could you can leverage the three D adaptive clearing for to, to really get more efficient, you know, programming and more efficient cycle time. So, I'll, I'll real quickly. I won't have to walk you through all the mouse clicks, but uh, when I'm done, uh, I can give you some stats that are, I think, pretty alarming. So, uh, what I did is two different jobs to compare um, this part machined with the 2D adaptive versus the 3D adaptive. So, uh, what you can see is we just did a face mill. Uh, and then here we did a 3D adaptive toolpath. So really, with just a few mouse clicks, um, if, I mean, we can go through it real quick. But with just a few mouse clicks, like like you were showing before, I contained it to the inside of this pocket, so that one tool would just do the inside. And what we had was a, a quarter inch MA Ford one, you know, three flute one inch diameter or one inch length of cut tool. Uh, so really, all I had to do was select the, the containment, and I don't think, yeah, so then I also selected the one one selection for the depth. Uh, and it basically roughed that whole part. It roughed not only the radially, but it roughed the, the Z heights too. So uh, then with just a few clicks with a much bigger end mill, a three-quarter inch end mill, I very quickly roughed the outside, but then you can see it also roughed the Z heights. So that's the advantage of having a, a 3D adaptive clearing instead of a 2D adaptive clearing, is that it sees the part three-dimensionally. I'm pretty sure I, let's check it out here, it's been a little while. Um, so I did rest machining from previous operations. The advantage of that is it knew that it already cut the inside away. So I went in there and said, all right, I don't want to cut anything I've already cut. So you can see it didn't even look at the inside because it knew the inside was already roughed out. So it was just a few mouse clicks, and again, we can look and see what was selection. So I selected the tool. I didn't have to select any containment um, because I told it we were already going to do a rest machining from any previous operations. Um, and yeah, so I selected, you know, I don't need to machine anything higher than, than this surface. So basically it only looks at anything between this line and this line, right? So don't even look at anything else. Just look at anything between there and there. So with just a few mouse clicks, you got the outside rough. Uh, in contrast, you know, in the 2D, you'd have to, you know, rough that, and then you would, you know, how are you going to finish the floor, which is, to jump back and forth a little bit, my one of my favorite reasons for the 3D toolpaths is to use the horizontal 
uh, 3D horizontal. Now, I actually didn't discover that for about a year after I was using the software. Um, when I click on, on this, you can see it does a Z finish pass on all these feet. It does a Z finish pass on that, which is a different height than that, which is a different height than that. And it also gets in there and does a finish pass too. So the same thing with just a few mouse clicks. Um, you can see I didn't have to make any containments. Um, I selected some heights, so there's just a couple extra mouse clicks. I think probably five mouse clicks you can um, close that so I don't have to regenerate it. So with probably four or five mouse clicks, you could you could get in there, do basically definish all your all your heights. The nice thing about, I mean, we could go on and on about that, but the nice thing is, you know, with that same tool finishing the Z height here and here and here, they're all going to be really tightly tolerant to themselves. Sometimes it might not be the most efficient way to machine it, but a lot of, you know, if you're not doing a ton of volume, uh, it's definitely the most efficient way to um, program it. And if you wanted to hit these with a bigger ball, you know, bigger end mill, uh, you, could, you could define the height to only do the, the Z finish on that. So uh, 3D horizontal is a really, really good, efficient tool for that. So uh, the real genius of, of the um, 3D toolpaths and 3D adaptive toolpaths, in my opinion, is the rest machine. So if you look here with a, with a uh, let me select that. If you look here, you can see that the quarter inch tool wasn't able to fit between here or here or here. So um, if you do a rest machine, you can get a smaller end mill, and you can also see the quarter inch toolpath couldn't clean up these, these corners very good. So we could get rid of those if we wanted, but I, I don't like overloading my finish tools. So uh, we were able to, to go in here, and all I did was a control D for duplicate this toolpath, and then all I did was go in here, select a smaller tool. So if you look here, it's a 3 16 uh, end mill with a reduced shank. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a short flute, but it's a reduced shank that will reach down to one inch. So in this, you know, it's a pretty deep pocket for a, for a 3 16 end mill. But you go in there and you change the tool, uh, the tool, and then you come down here and say do a rest machine. Uh, and machine the rest of the material that's left over after the previous operation. So you define some heights, and then here I define, you know, it's already predefined by it won't cut any deeper than the flute length of the tool, or 90% of the, I, so I have that set to 90% of the flute length of the tool. So that's a good tool tip if, if, uh, if, you, aren't already, if you are not already using uh, expressions, you can right click and either hit F2 or edit expression. This is, I think, an underused feature in HSM. It's very, very simple to cut based on the tool, the tool size and not just a random number that you think sounds good or you know from your tribal knowledge. You can actually, you'll find that the more you utilize percentages of the tools, whether it's the flute length or the radial, you know, the diameter, you'll find that you'll get a lot, lot better results. And the real genius is later on, if you change that tool, you'll also change your intention, which is usually uh, based on the percentage of the tool. So if you look here, uh, we're cutting 40% of the diameter of the tool. And more than likely, that's your intention. So if you change your tool later, for whatever reason, you maintain a radial cut of 40% of the tool. So uh, that's a good little tip. But if you see, uh, instead of having to come in with a smaller end mill in a 2D adaptive strategy, you'd either duplicate it and come up with a smaller end mill, and it's going to cut a bunch of air until it gets to these, these, uh, these sections the smaller tool can come to. Or you're going to have to come up with some sort of you know, tool path like this, that so you cut a whole bunch of air so you can get it in between here. And that's probably an older way of doing things, but, you know, generally you would cut around here 
and you already cut a lot of this. So you, you do a toolpath all the way around this boss so you can cut in between here and in between here. It used to be the way to do it, but now with the rest machining and inside 3D adaptive, it's a good way to do it. So the other way we use rest machining here was because we cut the outside of this part with a three quarter inch end mill, you can see I did the same thing with, with this toolpath. I just did a control D for duplicate, or you can just come down here and hit duplicate. It duplicates the exact same job. You drag it down here, and then you just change the tool to this quarter inch tool, and then come in here and say rest machine from previous operations, which I didn't have to do because it was already it was already selected. But you can see the quarter inch tool can't get into these corners because these corners are 130 130 radius. So I needed to get in there with a the quarter inch tool. And so the tool comes in there and very efficiently and, and intelligently knows it only has to get in and machine those, those corners out before a finish pass that we do there. So if we didn't do that, we would overload the tool on a finish pass, probably get a lot of chatter in these corners. You know, you can do that without 3D, but you can see we did it here. But what that entailed was I had to make a sketch of very time consuming sketch to tell it, you know, here's the corner, here's basically what was left after our three quarter inch tool went through there. So then you would have had to go in here, make a whole bunch of selections. You can see the geometry selections are pretty lengthy. And then you had to define the stock with that, that sketch. So it's a lot more a lot more selections. And if you're programming and you know hopefully we're all in business to make money. And if you're programming, you're probably not making money. You make money when your machine's cutting. So it's an easier way to get it out to the machine. So real quickly, I'll drag my spreadsheet. I was showing showing some of the guys the difference between the 2D adaptive thinking and 3D adaptive thinking was we reduced the tool operations from 16 to 12, which is 25% fewer. So that part's not a huge deal if you just look at it, you know, but by 16 versus 12, it's, it's not a huge difference. But what you really need to look at is the geometry selection. So on the first example, or what I was kind of showing is the second example, the 2D adaptive clearing, I had to go in there and select uh, 57 different geometry selections. Uh, that starts adding up. And it, not only is it geometry selections, but you have to think about all those. It's time you have to decide what you're going to select. Well, with the 3D adaptive, that's reduced to only 11. So it's an 81% 80, geometry selection uh, reduction. And then the real genius is uh, the, the simulated cycle time. So in theory, with the, the way I, I went through it with the 2D, and I'd be pretty confident that that part would go through without any tool breakage or any issue, and we have a good part. We're looking at about a 20 minute cycle time. And that would be reduced to uh, about 10 and a half minutes. So a little more than half half the cycle time uh, cut down. So um, that's kind of my presentation on that. Thanks, Tim. That, that was awesome. So um, I think everybody got a good view there of why you would use 3D toolpaths on a 2D part. And um, there's a lot of benefit in there. So now's your chance, everybody. I know those of you on the West Coast uh, might be thinking about getting back to work. Uh, it's uh, We've had a good run here today. In fact, I'm looking at everybody who started on this webinar is still here. So hopefully uh, that means you guys were interested in the topics. It's been a quiet group today. Uh, we usually get a lot more questions. So when I don't get a lot of questions, I think either we've answered your questions or it just went woof right over the top of everybody's head. So give us feedback. Um, you've got my email address. It's Derek at P9Cam.com. That's D-E-R-E-K at P9Cam.com. And then Tim's email address. Tim, why don't you go ahead and say that so I don't mess it up. Yeah, it's real simple. Man with two first names. It's Tim, T-I-M, dot Paul, P-A-U-L. And that's at autodesk.com. 
Okay, so last chance, guys, if you have any questions. If not, we'll just go ahead and wrap this one up for today and get back to our Friday afternoon. Okay, looks like everybody's good to go. Um, so thank you, everybody, and I'm getting uh, a lot of people coming in saying thanks and not too many complaints yet so far. So good stuff, everybody. Thank you. We do appreciate it. We re realize that you're investing your time into this as well. Um, so we'll be doing this again. We've got three more sessions set up for the month of April. So watch your email. You will get an invite. Feel free to send us feedback or ask questions or clarifications. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time, Tim. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. And we'll see everybody. Thank you. We'll see you all next time. Thanks. Bye now.